Welcome to episode 69 of the World Builders Anvil. I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram, and today's topic is the art of war, storytelling. Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place that will help prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builders Anvil. I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram. Let's sup from the mug of Java and build. Okay, welcome back. And today I'm going to talk about the art of war storytelling. Now, to understand the art of war, there are a few things that you really need to understand from war storytelling. There's a great article on a website called tvtropes.org. And it goes into a lot of detail into sort of do's and don'ts for tropes with war storytelling. I kind of agree with their analysis that you need tropes in storytelling war. Whether you're doing a chapter in a book or a couple chapters or your story itself is about war. It's important to understand there are some notable things. And I don't want to go over them all again, but there are uh, certain tropes I think we need to talk about here. One. Realism is not the goal. The goal of storytelling is not realism. It is enjoyability with your target market. Now, there are numbers out there, and I don't know how good or bad they are, but about 1% of the U.S. population accounts for the soldiers are all volunteer army. Now, because it's true, most people have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to realism in war. Um, they might even understand weapons. They might understand gear and organization. But they're missing the fundamental understanding, the fundamental exercise of war for volunteers, which is achieving your mission and survival. Very few people go in with the notion that they are going to die. However, the more time they spend in conflict, the more realistic that becomes. Now, the way their mind deals with it might not be as in them dealing with at that moment. But the idea is you can never convey realism and war into story. So don't try. Do the best you can. And maybe you are a person who has extreme understanding. Maybe you are a combat veteran who's seen a lot of things. You also have to understand, unless your target audience are other war people, most people aren't going to get the subtle nuances that you're talking about in the sort of range of conflicts. It's not good or bad, and I'm not saying don't try. I could be full of crap. I'm no expert on the human psyche. But I don't think the the goal is realism. Now, you might have realistic portions of the book. Damage for weapons might kill. A lot of people get this sort of crazy notion that, you know, it takes five shots for me to be killed because that's what it takes in the first version of Call of War I ever played. As long as I didn't get shot five times, I survived. I could take stim packs or do whatever to heal up myself up quickly. And that's not necessarily where you want to go either, but the thing to keep in mind is it's not realistic. It's not your job to make it realistic. As realistic or not as you want it to be, you know, the actual experience of war does not need to be realistic. Now, a good trope to deal with here is there are usually three types of protagonists in war movies. There is a hero, that person you're following through his experience throughout or through part of a conflict. That's your hero. The squad, that's a group of close buddies who live and die together. Uh, The story might be following them. The badass, your Rambo. Is your Rambo there or not? Now, you don't necessarily need to take any of these in your story. Um, more modern storytellers adds in rulers, you know, sort of your, uh, you know, winter is coming, you know, let's, let's rewrite the War of the Roses and talk about it from the scale of the kings and the queens who took place in the war. And that's what Game of Thrones does, and they do a good job of it. So it doesn't necessarily have to be at the l- level of a battlefield, but if you do, it's usually a hero, a squad, or a badass. Now, war sucks versus the glory of battle. Uh, this is one I, I think you can play with a little bit, or two tropes. You know, on one end you have books that war sucks, and on another end there's the glory of battle. 
which is you are that victorious person who charges up that hill. You're that hero who takes that flag from the enemy and wins the war. Both of these things exist in real life, um, and you can play with them at either way. You can even have glory of battle in a book that doesn't glorify war. Uh, you know, you take an American sniper, and he had the glory of battle at moments, but for him that faded, and, and there were consequences in the movies. Same thing with war sucks. War does suck. War sucks all the time. Unless you're engaged in it, there's an adrenaline rush that you might get from it, which makes it not always suck, makes it the glory of battle possible instead. So I think you can find some kind of balance between war sucks versus the glory of battle. And you don't necessarily have to use them up front the way they expect. Have the glory of battle, someone feel that glory, and then live with the consequences of their actions. Or a person who thinks war sucks, however keeps benefiting from the actions of wars. There's some things I think you need to keep in mind uh, beyond tropes when it comes to the art of war storytelling. And these were broken up into tropes into their article, which is much more comprehensive and a great read. However, there are a few things I think you need to keep in mind. Battle might bring up conflicting emotions. So you might have someone who's exhilarated and completely fearful. Uh, which those two don't seem to conflict, but you might have someone ecstatic and scared to death. The motions don't have to make sense, especially in those moments in war where there's severe risk to life of yourself or you're about to do damage to something you don't want to. Uh, AKA sort of, you know, the trope of having to, you know, sniper the child. Uh, you, the characters will probably never want to do that, even in and medieval books were killing children and women weren't uh, quite the stigma they are today. Uh, usually the authors themselves are going to have issues with moments like that and are going to use those to manipulate, to manipulate the people who are reading their books. You know, you have the villain brutally murder and feel no remorse of the child or, you know, the damsel in distress who wasn't saved. Those are all fine. But understand that in battle, you're going to have simultaneous emotions, or the people who are involved in the battle are going to have simultaneous emotions to try and help survive. If those get out of balance, those might be cues to kill off characters. Uh, if you have a character who becomes overly paranoid, starts threatening his uh, companions, or maybe even someone who gets so over-exhilarated in trying to accomplish something that he doesn't keep his head down, those are the kinds of people who are probably going to be killed in battle. You kind of need both to keep yourself surviving. Stealth. Stealth is boring when it works. Now, and this works okay for video games because there's a thrill in using a controller to sneak up and commit bloody uh, murder on a virtual foe. And so there's an exhilaration from it. And reading it, stealth is boring. To put it in, in the scope, there are what they call three kinds of crawl, crawls in the arm. One is a high crawl, and that's kind of where you want to get shot, so you keep your head up and you drag yourself by your arms from point A to point B. And really, you'd probably only do that if there was some something covering you, so you could not be seen, or a physical wall to help protect your head from being shot. Um, but hey, uh, that is one type of crawl. Uh, it's relatively slow, but that's the fastest of the crawl. Then you have what they call the low crawl, which is where your head and helmet is planted down, basically pointed towards the enemy, and your arms are going out, stretching out and pulling down. You know, you have the rifle slung between your thumb and your finger of one hand, and, and you're literally dragging yourself. Really slow, but another type of crawl that you have. These are the two extreme sports cars of crawling. Or the better way to think about it is a high crawl for crawling speed is like your Porsche. A sedan would be your low crawl. And then at the uber other end would be a sniper low crawl. And that is literally where you are pulling yourself by your fingertips. Very slowly across the field to get into position to take a shot. It is exceptionally long periods of time to do such things. There's a story of the um, of the sniper from World War, from Vietnam. I'm sorry, 
who was doing this, trying to get into position, and essentially going through a field full of guards um, successfully. But it took weeks for him to cross just a field, just 50, 100 feet. I forget what the exact distance was. But it took him a long time because he could not risk. So he spent a lot more time waiting for that mo perfect moment to pull himself just an inch or so. Very uh, crazy, boring. Not saying that you should cinematically speed up stealth. However, you might want to find a storytelling mechanism to avoid the drudgeries of actual real stealth. Uh, okay, understand the weapons. Whether you're in medieval or you're in all the way through futuristic, understand what the weapons that you're, that are going to be involved in the conflict are, the kinds of damage they do. Do research on real weapons. Something that will approximate the weapon. If you have this strange uh, triangle thing that they swing down upon someone, well, kind of pick the best weapon that will approximate that. And do research on what happens when you get hit. Understand the sharpness. Not every uh, sword is designed to be sharp. Some do crushing damage. And they have a, they have a little thin and they can pierce through bone. And, and there's a cut involved too, but it's really more through crushing than it is through slicing. Like a katana is really a slicing weapon, but there are weaknesses in having a weapon like that. A katana trying to, you know, to parry could get bent or, or, or break. Um, especially if you put like a giant two-handed sword and it, it hits a katana, it's probably going to shatter a katana or bend it and make it unusable. So the design of all weapons aren't necessarily what you think. Short knives are very effective weapons. Uh, you know, you talk to special forces, I believe it's the SEALs uh, use a three-inch blade. And if you've ever seen them, there's a show that used to be on Spike TV where it would be Warrior versus Warrior. There was a SEAL versus a um, Spezna. And, and this was exaggerated stuff, but they showed a SEAL going to town on this corpse-like entity, and they were measuring the damage. And even though the Spezna had a six-inch blade, which is... I would say kind of peak size for killing people. Those seals really just went to town with a three inch knife. And I really apologize if they weren't seals because that, as a veteran, I understand I really just insulted you. And I apologize for that. Okay. But understand your weapons. And if they're bigger weapons like artillery, understand what's going to happen when they hit. It's more, it, it's not going to be necessarily stereotypical to what you think. If a longsword, hits my arm it's, and cleaves it off, it's not going to be a clean wound like a katana would make. Uh, you don't need to know all, the, all of the parameters and the precise scientific measurements, but just do research on the types of damage that weapons do, especially the ones that you're predominantly going to use. Or if there's really a scene where you're using a weapon to kill someone, let's say an arrow, do research on what happens when an arrow penetrates a body. Understand that arrowheads will make a huge influence on and that might have you modify arrows. Or you might look at arrows that were used in war and wonder why certain kinds were used. Maybe it was a long, thin, pyramid-looking arrowhead versus a big, wide-leaf arrowhead. Why, why did some people use one or the other? And when you do research, you can figure out why. One's more for penetration damage, effective against people in armor. The other is this big nasty things that you have to get out of someone's body or do extra damage going in. Some, you know, you can put barbs in the back of arrows, so if they try and pull them out, it's like murdering the person. You know, a lot of times you got to push an arrow through or you'll kill it if you try and pull them out. So understand your weapons. Now understand when magic gets involved, there could be damages done through there too. Understand that as a weapon as well. You don't need all the details for all the scenes until you write them. And maybe you're not sharing the, the gory detail. But understand what happened because that will also talk about the effect on the people who survive. If I get wailed in the head by a giant two-handed hammer and my skull's caved in, it's going to be more painful and it will be noted by my friends who survive and witnessed that happen. Uh, understand every army is not a professional military, especially in the U.S. today you hear about the professional military. Most military forces in the history of the world were not professional. They were gangs of people who got together. There is an organizational structure. Understand the organizational structure. Understand how 
you have to communicate. There are reasons why there are organizational structures in the military. There are reasons why battlefield commanders have a lot of power over their troops. And you can have situations where you might not have that happen, but think you have to think through the consequences of a really weak commander. In a professional military, it might be less damaging than in a amateur military. I don't know if amateur is really good, but a ad hoc military like you'd have in the medieval days where a bunch of knights would bring some men together and they would go meet up. There's a reason why you have the chain of command. There's a reason why you have a commander. And there's a reason why you have a lot of authority. Understand how those work. Understand if it's a professional military or not, because that will affect the quality of the soldiers. You know, Vietnam era soldiers had basic training to prepare for war. Uh, once that was done, and I don't know how long the basic trainings were at that point, but let's say they were eight and 16 weeks, you know, somewhere in there. Heck, let's make it 20 weeks. You know, you have a 20 week base training to prepare you for war. Not going to happen. Uh, and you might become quite proficient at doing your job. Don't get me wrong. Militaries are very good at training people, but the difference is someone who has veteran experience over multiple campaigns you know, there's a reason why you have this idea. If you ever played video games, they, they're strategic while you have green troops versus veteran troops. Fatigue is real. Now, this is something that people forget oftentimes in fantasy novels. Sometimes there are maybe reasons why you can hide or convolute it. But if you have a sword fight going on for an hour between two people, uh, it's after a couple minutes, it's going to start looking real pathetic. If you're on the battlefield, and you're fighting all day, you're going to be utterly exhausted. It will be a lot of lethargia followed up by quick, strong action. And the person who has the quicker, stronger action plus the better gear wins the fight. And that's another one I should have added in here is gear. You know, there's a reason why knights were more likely to survive than a peasant uh, militia in a medieval fight. That's because of their equipment was harder to kill them. Plus, you're more likely to be taken as a prisoner to be ransomed if you have money. And now the ultimate reason you can't really tell good sto war stories, you can't sell fear for life to a reader. And even in video games where it's an interactive thing, you can't have that risk of life as you're interacting in a video game. So one of the primary driving forces that affects people to act the way they do, and it could be an infinite number of ways, but when they're in war, a veteran's life is at risk. Heck, when you're not at war, you're on a, you know, a Bradley. Fall and crack your head open on a Bradley, you're probably going to die. Being a soldier is a dangerous job in peacetime and is a lot more dangerous in wartime. So you can't really sell and give the reader that fear. However, I think what you have to do in the story is convey the fear to the individuals who are experiencing it as they experience it. And sometimes they're going to experience it while it's happening. Maybe it will be delayed reaction and that they will make the steps necessary and then have that, oh my goodness, I could have just died there for you. Or you could ignore it. I, I, I don't think it's a good idea, but you could. Uh, and if you have the badass storyline going, you probably will want to ignore it if he's really just a badass. Um, and one thing, you know, to keep in mind here on Veterans Day in the U.S., if you want to get great ideas, Talk to soldiers of all varying ages. Go to an American Legion or a VFW and talk to people about war stories. And ask for permission first. Some people might not want to tell you their war stories. Don't feel like they owe it to you to tell you this. But if you find people who actually want to talk about their war stories, let them tell you. And over time, it's going to probably change a little bit their mind as, you know, the the 72 foot fish I caught when I was in the first grade is probably slightly smaller than when I first caught it in the first grade. But, you know, they're going to have the best stories for combat. And and the best to, one, give you examples of what those conflicting emotions might be at any given time. So ask a vet. And it is Memorial Day. Uh, you can't ask the people who died, but you can ask the people who survived. So ask a vet. The world building task for the day. Pick a conflict and create the material support for a battle. Essentially, write up what you need to have a battle. So if you have a couple competing factions, 
figure out what kind of weapons they're going to use, and prep a little battle. Which will lead you into the world-building task of the day, which is to write a short story about a battle before you write a war. A war can be a long scope of things, anywhere from a hundred years war to the War of 1812 to whatever war you want to pick. Each of them are going to have a different life, a different cadence than every other war. The Hundred Hours War was a very wait, 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 go until you're exhausted and the war's over. Vietnam, from what I heard, was a lot of boredom followed by extreme fear from, you know, talking to people who served at least in the Japanese theater in World War II. It could be, it could be constant fear, constantly under fire, constant stress for the entire engagement of an island. So war, each war is going to have its own rhythm. And if you write multiple wars, they should not feel the same story as story. Now, I think you're going to have a more similar rhythm when weapons are older, when it's slower to do combat than in today, to where combat is constantly involving battle to battle, maybe. So keep that in mind, but write a story about a battle and then figure out how to group your battles together in a war. Okay, the T's. It takes two, or maybe more. And as always, make sure to go to Garduel.com. That's G-A-R-D-U-L dot com for the show notes. It'll be under Podcasting, World Builders, and That's a great place to get all of the information from the episode that you've just listened to and to see all the resources that we've talked about in this episode. Thanks for joining us this episode of the World Builders Anvil. Please be sure to rate and review us in iTunes, and please help get the word out to your friends about our show. And join me, Jeffrey W. Ingram at Garduel.com to see the progress of my world and learn why I made the choices I did. And please contact me and let me know the topics you would love to hear in the future. Now strike, why the myth rolls high.